We might get started. I'm mindful that we have a really jam-packed schedule. Don't want you to miss out on anything. We also have a panellist who needs to pop out a bit earlier today. So I want to stick to time so we can hear as much of the rich and fabulous insights from our um, fabulous bunch of panellists that we have today. So thanks everyone for tuning in today for our learning from local government, keeping prevention of violence against women on the agenda webinar. It's so great to have such a fantastic um, turnout and really looking forward to today. As I said earlier, my name is Marianne Clark and I work in the, um, the prevention team at the Domestic Violence Resource Centre or DVRCV. Um, my role there is the Prevention of Violence Against Women Training Manager. Um, and I've also got a, a, a background in local government. So this is an area of interest and expertise and, and passion of mine as I'm sure it is for you too. I'd firstly like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners and custodians on the land that we are meeting um, each of us here today. We're all meeting on different lands. And in particular, I want to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' continuing <coughs> connection, their people's resilience, their cultural heritage, and their continuing connection to land, waters, and community across Victoria and Australia. And I pay my respects to Elders past, present, and emerging. And I extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us today, so welcome. Um, we've got a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, I'd like to let you know that we are recording um, today's session and so that'll be available um, on DVRCV's YouTube channel after um, today's event. Um, our speakers will be taking questions at the end. Um, so if you've got any content related questions that spring to mind um, during the webinar, just pop them in our Q&A window, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can also like or upvote um, any other attendees' questions. So if you're really keen on those or they've asked something you're, you're interested in, and that'll help us to identify some of the most popular questions for our panel because we've got you know, limited time. Um, and also please note that um, we won't be tolerating any disrespectful or um, question, inappropriate questions and they will be removed um, from the webinar. So um, we please ask that we don't include those. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge importantly that talking about family violence, and the prevention of violence against women can have an impact whether or not you have this experience. So if you're feeling impacted in any way during this discussion, please take a break and do what you need to do to look after yourself. Um, and if you or anyone you know needs support, we encourage you to contact 1800 Respect um, or Safe Steps, the Victorian Statewide Service, um, and we'll include those um, details on, on the chat for you. Um, we'll also include um, details um, and tech-related support and info in our chat um, window, so keep an eye out on that too, and if there got any questions um, about um, tech or posting questions, you'll find details in there. So in today's webinar on uh, learning from local government on keeping prevention of violence against women on the agenda, our panellists are from across local government. Kelly Nagel, Dr Susan Rennie, Chrissy Nicholson and Mandy Roche will be joining me in a discussion about the prevention of violence against, violence against women in local government and how local governments a keeping prevention on the agenda in the current COVID-19 context. So I'd firstly like to introduce our panellists. Kelly firstly has a background in community development, prim primarily working in the public housing and home welfare sectors. And she's working in local government and preventing violence against women space and has done so for the past 13 years. Kelly's currently the policy advisor for preventing violence against women at the Municipal Association of Victoria, or the MAV, where she represents local governments on a number of statewide task forces and committees, and to support the implementation of the Gender Equality Bill and the Royal Commission into Family Violence Recommendations. Our next panellist, Dr. Susan Rennie, is the current Mayor of Darabin and was elected as a councillor there in October 2016. 
Susan's an accomplished public health professional with significant experience in public policy and governance. And in addition to her role as a counsellor, Susan's employed at the Victorian Local Governance Association and has many years experience <coughs> alongside councils on public policy and community development projects. And prior to being with the VLGA, Susan worked for Primary Care Partnerships for over 10 years. Next, Christy Nicholson is the Family Violence Prevention Officer at the City of Casey, and she has over 15 years experience integrating gender and behaviour change issues in organisations and communities globally. So prior to council, she was an aid and development worker responding to emergencies and long-term development programs across Africa, Asia and the Pacific. And Chris is a passionate advocate for social change and loves working with groups to make meaningful contributions to the world. And Mandy Roach has over 15 years experience in local government. She started at Knox City Council in the role of Metro Access Officer, later worked as a coordinator in the council's social planning team and community strengthening team. Mandy's currently working at Mornington Shire Council as the Equity Inclusion Officer, which aligns with her strong commitment to social justice. So thank you to our panellists for being part of today's session. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Um, a quick update to just to let you know that Kelly has been unavoidably called away. She has a really important um, farewell and celebration to get to. Um, but so she's going to duck out a little early around two. Um, but for um, Kelly uh, ducks out, we'll be um, we'll, we'll be inviting her and encouraging her to, to um, share and provide her wisdom and expertise. But we'll also be providing some frequently asked questions and responses and sharing them after the session. Um, and we also encourage you to jump on Basecamp if you've got questions after the session that we might be able to um, connect and, and follow up for you too. So let's begin. So for over a decade, Victorian councils have been leading action at a local level to address the drivers of violence against women, as you know, and promote gender equality. So we wanted to ask Kelly first to kick off today's discussion, if you could give us an overview, Kelly, of the role of local government in preventing violence against women, small question, and how this work has evolved over the years. And perhaps also a little insight about the, the key milestones and development that have contributed to these changes. Thanks, Marianne, and hi, everyone. Um, great to have the opportunity of being here today. I've been a big fan of PIP since inception and really pleased to see it going from strength to strength with these webinars. And apologies that I do have to leave early today. Um, the manager of social policy at the MAB is leaving after 24 years of retiring. So um, very important that I get to her farewell. Um, and as Marianne said, I'm very happy to answer any questions post webinar um, electronically or, or by phone. I'd also like to start by acknowledging the land on which we're meeting today and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where I am, the Wurundjeri people, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and also any Aboriginal people that are joining us today. So today, the next slide, thanks Alice, is just a really quick snapshot, a very potted history of the role local governments played in the prevention of violence against women and how we've become leaders in this space. I'll be able to share a couple of promising um, practice examples and highlight where they've sort of come from and, and where they've got to and leave you with just a couple of the big ticket items that uh, council will, will be influencing council's work over coming years. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there were clearly decades of work prior to me coming around in 2007, primarily by women, that's enabled local government to progress their work in this space. And this again is only my um, experience of local government's involvement, and so it's obviously a very narrow perspective, but I hope that um, having worked statewide for a number of years now, I've got a pretty good, pretty good sense of what's going on. And I could talk for hours about this stuff and I have 10 minutes, so We'll move on to the next slide. For me, I think uh, a real game changer was the Victorian Police uh, Family Violence Code of Practice. It real, under Christine Nixon's leadership, it really moved, meant improved data. And improved data meant that councils could get it on their agenda, whether through their community safety plans or their health and wellbeing plans. And certainly at, in Darabin, there was a partnership formed between council and the police um, called the Darabin Family Violence Issues Group. And um, their funded work, that, sorry, their work 
actually received a Community Safety Award in 2006. Um, and that led to Helen McPherson Smith Trust, the philanthropic body, to approach council and say they wanted to fund a funded project in 2007. And that project was to explore what role councils might have to play in, in family violence. And um, that was an 18 month philanthropic project that I was lucky enough to um, be employed in. And so that was the beginning of my journey in this space. But we were still not talking prevention. Many councils hosted and convened their local family violence networks. And in 2006, Moreland was the first council to have a dedicated strategy to family violence, but not a dedicated officer and not prevention. So we were still very much in the response space. And I should say that Darabin continued to fund project officer roles post the philanthropic funding, and also became the first council in Australia to fund an ongoing full-time prevention officer in 2014. So well done, Darabin. Move on to the next slide. You can see from this graph that's taken from the 2019 MAV PBOR GE survey, uh, just how far we've come in terms of councils investing in this work through dedicated positions. 55 councils indicated that they allocate FTE to the portfolio, and at least 32 of these are fully council funded positions now. So that's quite radical in such a short period of time. Next slide, thanks. Going back to the beginning again, um, Vic Health is the game changer in Victoria. Um, their investment in prevention, not only for councils, but for the whole state, and I would say actually the nation, they've influenced the work there. Um, and it's the point of difference as to why Victorian councils are way ahead of other state and territory councils. Um, in 20, 2006, there were the 29 small grants um, allocated, including PIP and five councils. And importantly, what this investment meant was the beginning of a prevention workforce in Victoria. In 2007, the Health, Vic Health Framework was released and that took our work to another level because it provided the guidance on how to implement mutual, mutually reinforcing actions across, uh, across settings and across different population groups. And this framework is the foundation for the Change the Story, which our watch developed in 2015 with Vic Health and AMROs. Um, and it's a great fit for local government because it actually crosses the settings where people live, learn, work and play, which of course councils have a massive influence with um, and connection to. In 2008, Vic Health scaled up five of the original 29 projects, including PIP, and two with councils, Maribyrnong and the Darabin Interface Project. And Maribyrnong was the first council to develop a dedicated strategy in 2007, and then the Scaled Up Project. And now at least 47 councils have this, and I'll go to the next slide. This graph shows you the numbers that are formal acknowledgements, um, but also the significant number of councils that are planning to implement or, or, or adopt these um, different strategies. So that means it's a great opportunity for us to do further work and strengthen the work. And I'd also like to mention here that since 2010, most of the women's health services have developed regional strategies uh, around, and prevention plans. And our survey results also show that councils are key partners in this work. And I'll go to the next slide. And this is where the, the statewide kind of approach began. So Vic Health invited um, councils to apply to, um, to undertake a statewide project. Both Maribyrnong and Darabin submitted, um, and I was fortunate that Darabin was the successful council. Um, however, we worked so closely with Maribyrnong, we did start calling ourselves Darabinong for a while there. Um, this is where the network was established. It was where the e-news was established. We held a massive conference that I know Mary Ann was at um, back in August 2010 at the MCG, and that was a real watershed moment in terms of we had eight councils present on their work, and we had the Premier get up and announce that they would fund a position at the MAB. So up until this time, it had all been Vic Health funded. So state government funding has continued um, year by year since 2011. The network has met face-to-face -face since 2010, um, but we moved online, or we actually offered web conferencing since mid-2018, but we've moved fully online, obviously, this year. And uh, 67 of the 79 councils have now participated in the network. Um, we are thinking we're going to actually stay online because it's, uh, we had four rural councils attend in June for the first time ever, which is really exciting. And it just, it's just really working as a, a bit of a leveller and, and enabling better mentoring between more experienced and new councils to the work. Um, and 
So there's only, yeah, as I said, 12 councils that haven't participated. We've held large scale forums every two years. Um, and we've also conducted a voluntary survey every two years since 2013. And in 2019, 65 councils participated, answering over 100 questions. And it's a voluntary survey, it's quite phenomenal. Um, we also work closely with DHHS to include five questions that would satisfy the new reporting requirements from councils since the Royal Commission and the Health and Wellbeing Act being changed for councils needing to include measures in their municipal public health and wellbeing plans as to what they're doing to address family violence. Um, and so that was a really um, good opportunity to sort of leverage a little bit more engagement with that survey. We've had a massive growth in the e-news that you can see there. We're up to over 1,100 um, subscribers, growing at about 20 to 40 a month. So please subscribe if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, I think, and just the, the networking that happens and capacity building that's happening through that ongoing funding at the MAV. Unfortunately, it's, as I said, it's been year by year by year. So we don't have like a five year strategic plan. Um, however, it, it's certainly a very busy space and I think it's, um, it's working pretty well. I just wanna move on now to the next slide and a couple of areas where I think councils have got a real opportunity and influence and Sport and Rec is one of those. Um, Moreland undertook research back in 2009 to look at their, who was using their pavilions and grounds and, and leisure centres, et cetera, and found that only 8% were women and girls. So they invested in an active women and girls officer who developed an active women and girls strategy. And by 2018, you can see their participations now at 23%. I think this is a really good example because VicHealth, who haven't actually, it's not been their funded work, but have gone, this is a really important model to explore and dig deeper and see what might be possible across all of local government. So the MAV is currently working with Vic Health and Moreland and a, and a whole steering committee of um, Sport and Rec Victoria and women, the Office for Women in Sport and Rec Victoria, et cetera, um, and surveying all councils as to what their current investment is in Sport and Rec, but not just in terms of, for women and girls, but not just in terms of infrastructure, but all that cultural stuff as well. So that's currently happening as we speak. So that will be a, a piece of work, very exciting going forward. Um, I'll move on to the next slide, thanks. I just think also we've really led as a, as a workplace. So local government in Victoria employs over 50,000 people, the majority are women. Um, but um, Surf Coast Shire back in 2010 was the first organisation in the world to introduce family violence leave into their EBA. And all councils now have these, this leave provision. And again, our survey um, details a whole lot of different aspects to that. Um, but you can see there that only 45 of the 64 councils that answered this question in our, in our survey actually have a policy. And it's all one thing to have an entitlement in an EBA, but if you haven't got an active policy being promoted to staff, it's very difficult to actually access that entitlement. And again, a shout out to Darabin as one of the leading policies here with actually a video explaining the policy so that even if, if you're not particularly literate and, and can't really absorb what a policy, reading a policy document, they've actually got a video explaining how to access that entitlement, which is really important at induction for new staff. Um, we'll move to the next one. And in addition to the funding, um, the state funding, the MAV, they've also, they also back in the day invested in nine councils through the cluster project. And that really added to the momentum that was already growing. And it also provided real leadership and learning for having some really experienced councils supporting those starting out. And many of the, pro the councils, the nine councils engaged in that cluster project can really trace their current leadership back to there. For example, Yarra Rangers um, Council now has two full-time, fully council funded positions that were part of that cluster project, which is just, it's just phenomenal. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. It's been a very heady times, 2015 till now. Um, as you know, obviously the Royal Commission, but also um, change the story being developed. And that um, of course is what the state policy documents, the strategic documents are aligned to, including free from violence, which is the stream of funding for my position and my colleague Rachel Close's position at the MAV. And moving on to the next slide, they're also the funding stream for the 10 small grants that were funded back in 2016-17. And all of those 10 projects are detailed on our Promising Practice portal. 
the image here is of the one of the 10 projects and it's an um, ongoing e-learning e resource and it's particularly important obviously in a COVID environment and this is now being completed by over 6,000 people which is just fantastic um, and the next round of grants with the 35 councils largest ever investment in local government at 2.7 million 35 one-year projects which we know is not good practice for embedding activity however council really councils have stepped up and embedded much of this work and i think that's particularly supported by 19 councils doing WER standards so the workplace equality and respect standards developed by our watch so that involves a whole implementation process that's beyond the one year so that why that's how that work can be sustained um, and I'll touch on the local government model at the end, so I might just move on to the next slide. So, I'm um, not sure where I'm up to with my 10 minutes, but this is, I'm at the end. Um, so, 16 days, we're currently working okay. on this. I'm okay, yeah. <laughs> um, we've got small grants to be offered to the 79 councils and 23 regional and statewide organisations in the next few days. Um, we've also got a booklet highlighting the uh, campaign achievements from last year that um, the MAV uh, managed in partnership with the Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria and obviously Respect Victoria. Um, obviously there'll be huge cha challenges with the 2020 campaign and COVID environment, but I'm sure people will get really creating, creative. We've been offering three R's and animal art three R's training. So the recognise, respond and refer training. Um, that's been really important again in COVID because um, our librarians and our customer service centres and things have noticed an increase in disclosures when people came out of, of lockdown first time round. And also the link between animal abuse and family violence is um, hand in glove. And, um, and thankfully, Animal Welfare Victoria have funded EDVOS to deliver animal three hours training. So we've been able to offer that quite a few times and we've got another four sessions lined up over the coming, over the coming months. Um, and, it's, and it's really, really um, been very successful. And there's also a new Local Government Act and Council elections coming up, which I know Susan Manny, Mayor Rennie will speak about. And the Gender Equality Act is just a game changer in terms of local government's work in the gender equality space. So um, obligations come into effect in March next year. Workplace gender audits have to be done by June next year to inform a gender equality action plan by October next year. So there's gonna be a huge amount of work being undertaken by councils and this work will need to be publicly available but also progress reports publicly available too as well every two years um, so it'll be an iterative process over the next few years no one will have it right some of the small councils still have paper-based HR systems so it's it's a big ask for what the, the Equality Act uh, requires so um, finally the local government model it's um, part of the new uh, rolling action plan. And it's going to be, it's being developed as we speak. It'll be piloted with a small amount of councils in, the, in early 2021. So probably maybe 10 or 12 councils. Um, and again, it'll be an iterative process over um, a number of years and with new councils coming on each year, but they are looking at three year initial model. Um, so, um, but by the end of the three year period, they're hoping that they'll have reached all 79 councils. So um, that's really exciting. And that will be that mutually reinforcing strategies, whole of council, multiple settings, multi across the lifespan, and obviously the multiple year investment. So watch this space. Um, that's it, the next slide. Lots of activity going on. I really could spend the day talking to you about it, but I don't have all day. <laughs> I was given 10 minutes. Um, there's no area of council that can't contribute to preventing violence against women. And I hope this quick snapshot kind of gives you a bit of a sense of how quick the journey's been really in just like a relatively short period of time. And I hope what you'll hear from Susan and Mandy and Chrissy today will also really provide you with that sense that there's no area of council that can't contribute to this work. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Kelly. That was a very well crafted, potted history of an incredible amount of work that has been led by you and the team at MIV and all of our fabulous council um, practitioners before us, many of who are in the room today. So thank you. And uh, yes, I'm sure we all look forward to watching this space and hearing more from you. Thank you again for 
pulling that together and I look forward to actually going back and watching that again because it's really heartening to see the work that's happening and has come before us and has informed the work yeah. that we're that, that you know we're, that is happening now so thank you Pleasure. um we will um move on um as you know given I think you touched on it uh, um there that we're in un unprecedented times and facing unique challenges keeping prevention on the agenda we always were before but now particularly in the context of a pandemic and Susan I wondered if we could turn to you now um, prior to becoming mayor of Darabin you worked in the primary prevention and violence against women sector and I, I wonder if you could tell us about how your prevention background informs your work as um, and your role, I should say, as the Mayor of um, Durban City Council. Sure. <clears throat> and, um, you know, whilst I've done some work in preventing violence against women in the past, a lot of my work has also been in preventing harm from gambling and in campaigning for equality. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that really attracted me to local government was the enormous potential at a council level to drive change that extends beyond one council area. Because mm -hmm. help is not built in hospitals, help is built in the settings in our community where people live. Um, we could build all the wonderful hospitals in the world that wouldn't create a healthier community. Hospitals treat illness. And I think that that is a perspective that's really important to bring into the work that we do in council when people talk about health. Because people's first thought about health and health services is doctors and it's that tertiary end. And there are a couple of key factors, I suppose, that led me to be really interested in being on council. One was some campaigning work I did around equality um, about 12 years ago now, when there was a, a campaign called Love Makes a Family, which was about uh, creating uh, access to reproductive technology for rainbow families and recognition of parents on birth certificates. And I got involved in that campaign and I saw firsthand how significant it can be to influence politicians and influence policy. And I visited um, a Liberal politician in the eastern region of Melbourne who subsequently changed his vote as a result of that visit to a piece of legislation in Parliament that only just scraped through. And he was the only Liberal in either House of Parliament. And so I started thinking quite differently about how you create health. And you create health through, through strategic conversations with decision makers. Another key thing that happened for me around about the same time was that a pub around the corner of my house applied for a planning permit for poker machines and the council at the time granted that planning permit. And I thought, you know, this isn't okay. We know we don't need more poker machines in our community. There wasn't a single pub in Preston that didn't already have poker machines. So the last thing we needed was another pub with pokies. And I actually took council to VCAT and appeal the planning permit decision. And I, I won that appeal. And so, you know, it was, you know, the irony is not lost on me that 12 years ago or 10 years ago, I was in VCAT against Darabin Council and now I'm the mayor of Darabin Council because I thought, you know, you, you can influence from, from outside or you can actually join the structures that you're seeking to change. And what I've seen since that time and in my last four years on council was that in local government, we have an extraordinary capacity to lead the conversations the nation is having. So at Darabin, we were the first council in the world to declare a climate emergency. And there's now close to 2000 local governments and other levels of government around the world who have taken that step to actually say, this is something we need to address. We were one of two councils initially to say that we would not celebrate Australia Day on the 26th of January and you know, we're not there yet with that campaign, but we sparked a national conversation that the country needs to have. And, you know, I would say we can't um, separate reconciliation from, from health as well. And, you know, I think without doubt, we are the council in Australia that has the strongest gambling policy to try and drive down our gambling losses and the extraordinary harm that's being created in that space. And the gambling industry dislike it intensely because they hate the idea that other councils might follow down the same path of putting in place a policy that actually in a meaningful way makes it harder for poker machines to be operated in our municipal area. And, and I draw on those three examples to actually illustrate how important the work of local councils is. And 
how significant the changes are that we can achieve, even if they are in our one local government area. So that the thing that one council does has a profound and lasting impact on the work of councils right across Australia and I would say beyond. And, and I think that's the key lesson that I've learned from my background in public health. And also that, you know, the most effective public health work actually often happens in the political arena with in conversations with decision makers. And I think that we shouldn't shy away from that. We should actually embrace that opportunity that it creates. And, and that's one of the reasons why I think achieving gender equity in our representation of councillors across Victoria um, is so profoundly important. At the moment, we know there's about 38% um, female councillors. That should be 50. And until we can get that at all levels of politics, we're going to have an ongoing struggle, I think. And Susan, thank you. And I wonder just in the, in the current COVID context, if you could reflect, uh, we'd love to get your thoughts on on in this current context, why it is now so important or more important than ever, arguably, you know, um, and you've, you've talked about perhaps um, um, some of those, you know, reasons why in terms of, you know, participation and, you know, equal participation and, you know, um, what the role of, you know, women are and how that's being, you know, supported in the current context. I'd love to get your thoughts on why it's so important to keep gender equality and the prevention of violence against women on the agenda in this current context? It's clearly, uh, to me, more important than ever. And I think partly that's because we know that there are some gendered impacts of COVID that haven't fully begun to be explored. The government's so busy responding overall to COVID and, you know, so by and large, I think they're doing a very good job, but there are gendered impacts in terms of what's happening in the workforce and in what in terms of what's happening in homes that are going to have a profound effect for years to come. And I'm not convinced that a gendered lens is being placed over recovery activities either. So when you look at well, how, how a government's planning to get out of this, they're planning to do massive infrastructure projects, invest hugely in building, and we know that's a male dominated area of work, which means that men are gonna benefit disproportionately from the recovery efforts and women are likely to be further left behind because that's not where um, the recovery is being targeted. And so I think that's one way in which we have to put a gender lens across policy responses and across government responses. And that's certainly something that we do at Darabin City Council. So there is a gender lens applied to any new policy initiative to think about who is gonna be impacted and are those impacts experienced in the same way by men and women? And if not, well, is, is that okay? And what do we have to do about that? And I think that that is um, one of the reasons this is so important. And it's a reason why it's so important to get women in leadership positions. And I think that's another thing um, that we have at Darabin that I would say has made a very profound difference in the last four years. So in the last council, there were seven male councillors and two female councillors, and there was a male CEO. In 2000, 2016, we had a very significant change in council. All five new councillors who were elected were women. So I think that was clearly our community saying they wanted to see a shift. And we ended up with a council that had six women and three male councillors. Uh, we had a change of CEO, we now have a female CEO, and we have a, a, a a leadership team of general managers that is also has more women than men. And I think that what we observe across the organisation is massive cultural shifts in, in, in the way we do things and in the way we approach um, different issues as a result of that. And I think that, um, you know, I, I remember early in my term of council actually calling out some of the male behaviour that I was seeing, particularly men speaking over the top of their female colleagues, not respecting the time frames, which suggested they felt a sense of entitlement and felt as though what they had to say was so important that they didn't need to stick to stick to the three minute speaking time. And actually standing up and calling that out and saying, you know, what we have here, when we talk about, oh, you know, it's not respectful when people ignore the mayor and they, they keep talking, is to say, well, this is a gender problem because the people who are doing that are the male councillors and not the female councillors. And I think it's very hard to call out those kind of behaviours if men are still in the majority, which is the case in most Victorian councils. 
And in fact, we know that those figures of, of female versus male councillors are skewed um, by councils like Darabin that actually have a majority of female councillors and that there are a number of councils in Victoria that only have one female councillor. And if you are the only female councillor on a council, it is going to be very hard to, um, to, to speak out for the gendered lens to be applied, to speak up when you see initiatives that disproportionately favour men. And, and we've seen those in councils for many, many years. You know, there, there was this idea that, oh, you know, that councils deliver maternal and child health services, so they must do more for women than for men. But actually, historically, if we look back on the investment that councils make, the biggest area of infrastructure investment councils make is in sporting infrastructure. And historically, that went 90% to men. And so men were the greatest beneficiaries of council spending. And until we start actually looking at that and analysing it, then it's very difficult to address it. And in a context where there's one female councillor and eight male colleagues, it's unlikely that that is going to be prioritised. And so I think that's why it's so important that we get uh, that we achieve gender equality in the, the representation of our elected councillors and, um, and also at a CEO level. And that, that is improving, I would have to say. Just in the last five years, we have seen improvements in leadership at senior councillors, and I think it begins to make more of a difference. Thanks, Susan. We're now going to kick over to our um, practitioners on the panel. Love to get their perspectives, and as we've heard, earlier um, for many years local councils have been working with people across all life stages and settings um, to embed gender equality and and uh, respect into local communities um, so for mandy and chrissy would love to get your insights um, and give the audience a better sense of the work that local government does um, and perhaps you could share with us um, some of the major prevention initiatives that you've been leading in your um, local governments, um, and you know, particularly perhaps around the, the training and strategic planning and community-based um, projects that you've both been involved in. And perhaps, um, Mandy, if we can start with you, um, and then we'll, um, we'll invite um, Chrissy to, to share her insights. So Mandy, if I could start with you, that'd be great. Sure, thanks, Mary Ann. Um, look, firstly, I just want to say I learned a lot off Kelly then because I am actually fairly new to this to this field. So thanks, Kelly. <laughs> um, so I joined the Mornington Peninsula Shire a couple of years ago at quite a really interesting pivotal point in regards to developing policy. They, um, I came into the role and they had an expired prevention family violence plan, which was really done. Um, you know, before these family violence reforms. So we knew in the new development, we had quite a journey to go on. Um, and what we've produced is the Shire's first gender equality strategy. And that is a 10 year strategy to increase gender equality and reduce violence against women and their children. Um, it, it was a couple of years of undertaking. We of course used an evidence base to start with and then extensive community engagement both internally with Shire staff and the community. Um, we have used the national uh, Our Watch framework uh, that Kelly mentioned changed the story so that that primary prevention framework underpins everything we do. We like the Victorian government we've actually put the strategy into six key settings so that we do tap into where people work, live, play and recreate. So they are education and training, work and business, health, safety and wellbeing, leadership and representation, the sport and rec sector, media and arts and culture. So I, I, I think that's a real positive of, of the strategy because I think it's been difficult, what we've found over the journey is for people to make the link between gender inequality and family violence. But when you break it down into those settings, community settings, I really think that's going to support the work and actions going forward. So look, the year started off brilliantly. We launched the strategy 
um, 10 days before the pandemic hit. We had 500, over 500 people um, celebrate that event um, and was privileged enough to have Rosie Batty really back the strategy and she wanted to speak to it. She lives in our local community and that, that meant a lot to us. So look, it was a great celebration and then yeah, 10 days later, I've been working from home for six months. So the world certainly changed. Um, the, look, the way now, what I've focused on now is writing the first year action plan. That has a bit ambiguous, that has um, ambitious, I should say. It's got 33 actions that um, are led by people right across the organisation and in the community. Um, I thought I'd just touch on a few examples. So you know, one of the actions is around embedding gender equity design guidelines into our community infrastructure planning. So an example of that might be when we're uh, building sports clubs that we actually do make sure we've got the infrastructure to support the female participation. Right through to celebrating and promoting women's achievements, we hold an annual really successful International Women's Day and also support community groups, however they'd like to celebrate. Um, and our communications team here at the Shire have got an action around auditing the images in our photo library to make sure, just look, have we got that gender balance? And this is an opportunity we can challenge gender norms and stereotypes, you know, in those images that we get out there. Um, two key actions I just want to touch on that are really prevalent at the moment. Hallie mentioned the Gender Equality Act has been legislated. So that's a big piece of work for us. Although in some respects, we're kind of really ahead and prepared because we've got the strategy and we've got the plan. We actually still need to do that workplace audit and really understand, you know, where we sit at the moment, you know, understand that kind of bench line data because once we get targets and quotas, we need to know where we sit within that. So that's a piece of work to do with our people, people and culture team and really looking forward to that. And then just one other thing I wanted to touch on was um, for a couple of years, we've formed a family violence prevention collaborative out, out in the Mornington Peninsula and it's a collective impact approach. Um, obviously with us and our backbone organisation is Family Life. Also sitting on that is um, our Women's Health Service out here, Peninsula Health, our primary care network, um, our Bayside Integrated Family Violence Partnership, Brotherhood of St Lawrence and importantly a Victim Survivor Rep. So we're really looking you know, to mobilise the community out here with change. And we've been really fortunate to get Vic Health Healthier Masculinities funding. So that will kick off with that project this year to um, improve gender equality um, as, as well as health and wellbeing outcomes for men and boys in the broader community out here by addressing outdated stereotypes. So we're really excited about that piece of work. That's great. Thanks, Mandy. So much fantastic work. Chrissy, can I ask you to give us a little sense of what um, you're involved in in terms of prevention initiatives? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Marianne, and great to see you all today. Um, so I was reflecting on this question and got really excited about my job and the diversity of what comes under the Prevention of Violence Against Women. Uh, my role is, I guess, guided by our family violence prevention strategy and I work closely. We've also got a gender equality officer um, who we've just had a gender equality um, plan endorsed, an action plan endorsed. So we work closely together on a range of initiatives. And so my year, you know, everything from celebrating key campaigns such as 16 Days of Activism, where last year we had over 200 people holding hands in our plaza, reflecting on what they could do to make a difference in and to eliminate violence against women, through to training up young women's leadership group on how to be active bystanders. 
as we speak today, um, our Child Safe Coordinator is launching a Safe Body program, um, which also applies a gender lens to our childhood um, educators. So that's a really exciting um, program that also falls under that prevention lens. Um, we do a lot of orange door advocacy as well, and um, you know, everything from also, you know, as we've been mentioned before, around training up our local laws team on the, the link between animal abuse and domestic abuse, through to uh, training up our local businesses and SES on being an active bystander. Two of the projects that have been quite big um, in, that I'm working on um, have been uh, rolling out the Standing Up for Equality and Respect program, in which we trained over 500 people, both staff and community members, on how to be active bystanders. A part of that was um, training up a group of 14 champions of change across our organisations that had influence in different parts of our community um, and our workplace. And they've been fantastic advocates in all of the prevention work that we do. So it doesn't just sit in the laps of the gender equality or prevention workers, but it's spread across different parts of the organisation, which I think is really key. Um, the other big area and program I'm working on at, at the moment, and is similar to Mandy actually, is called Safe in Her City Gender Audit Tool. And that's, um, we're, we're partnering up with XYX Lab at Monash University, which is a design and gender specialist, to design a gender audit tool for places and spaces. So while there are currently guidelines around, existing around informing the design of places and spaces, um, my understanding is that this will be the first audit tool that will be um, actually be able to assess spaces and places. And what's different about this tool is that we're placing the voices of women and girls at the centre of that. So we're currently training up a group of women and girls who will train in gender and design. And they will be key and work in partnership with our city planners, our designers, our community safety teams to actually go and do the audits together. So their voices will be given just as much um, weight as our designers. So that's quite an exciting initiative that we're rolling out now. Um, and once it's piloted and improved, we'll certainly be able to share it with the wider sector. Uh, so I think that there's a, a couple of examples to go by. That's fantastic, Chrissy. I'd love to hear more about the design, but I, I won't. We'll pause because I'm, <laughs> I'm keen to know, I know it's perfect, keen to know, um, you know, following on from the, the fantastic work that you both shared, you know, great insights on that's happening. Um, just in terms of the current context, and we've heard a little bit um, from you all about how the current context and the pandemics informed and changed perhaps your prevention work. But I suppose I wondered if I could ask you to reflect on, have there been or what might have been some of the unexpected opportunities or insights that have arisen for you as a result of, um, of COVID-19? And if you could um, share those unexpected opportunities or, or pearls or insights with us. Shall I go first, Mandy? Yeah, do you want to kick off? Well, I'm still on uh, Okay, so yeah, COVID obviously brought a lot of changes and some things were brought to a bit of a halt, like the rollout and the pilot of our, our audit tool. But um, we did go into a bit of emergency response mode and a bit more into that response side. So what we've done is de designed a whole lot of policies and guidelines for our staff around, um, to, so both managers and staff who are experiencing violence, but also for our frontline workers, um, who particularly in our maternal and child health team, but also our customer service and across the range that are seeing a lot more disclosures within the course of their work. Um, so we rolled out training, family violence and how to manage disclosures training to over 200 of our staff. Um, in a three week period, we partnered with Women's Health in the Southeast to do that. Um, and ensured that any time, well in fact any time that we um, mention family violence, whether it's in that response mode, um, we will always 
include what the drivers of family violence being gender equality are. And so we use any opportunity to raise awareness around the prevention work that we do. Um, we also worked with uh, the gender equality officer and our PNC team to develop a pandemic response audit, well, sorry, analysis tool for our response and recovery team and our people and culture team. And as a result, we've made over 20 recommendations to apply a gender lens on our response and are, are currently working with them to ensure we can monitor um, and evaluate the impact of both the response, but also recovery moving forward. Uh, opportunity, I think the fact that um, family violence has been spoken about more so in the media, um, has really raised the profile and, and I guess, shone a light on the importance of family violence and the absolute prevalence of it. Um, and in a way, that's kind of raised the profile of our work within the organisation. And certainly we've had our leadership team completely behind it. So we've been doing both internal advocacy work and awareness raising, but also we've um, launched a gendered impacts of COVID communications campaign through our Facebook page. And so I've been taking it as an opportunity to raise the awareness of how people can escape violence and the 1800 numbers, um, the, applying a cultural lens as well. Uh, but the other aspect is providing that link between gender inequality and family violence and starting to try and uh, break down those barriers and raise awareness. Fantastic, thanks. Mandy, how about you? Any insights or pearls that you'd like to share with us, opportunities that yeah. have come up for you? Really similar to Chrissy in that, you know, as much as this is not really how we wanted to put a spotlight on the work, you know, um, you know, we're feeling for the people who are at home with restrictions and not in a safe environment. But yes, it has shone that light on it and it's given opportunity. Um, Kelly said before about the um, Triple R training they offered and the spots got taken up really quick. And, um, you know, an example is our leisure centre who, um, who got a contract with the leisure centre. They've come forward and said they want that training for their staff and we're about to do it with our customer service staff as well. And then back to the leisure centre, they want the whole 120 staff to then do gender equality training. So, yeah, it, it, it's sad that it takes a pandemic to shine a light. But I guess the other thing is, you know, gender inequality is just, you know, so in the spotlight as well. This pandemic has just really shown, um, you know, how much more effect it's had on, on women. And we are strongly advocating to our emergency management team in the Shire to put a gendered lens over recovery. And I think Chrissy has, has touched on that and done some terrific work. So that's going to be our opportunity that we, we can't respond like normal. We have to look at that vast inequality that we've seen from women, um, you know, both from a mental health and economic um, lens. Thanks so much, Mandy. It's really heartening to hear, as you said, it's um, it's devastating that we need to be having these conversations. But again, uh, also what I see is the fantastic innovation and agile, creative nature of prevention practitioners to move, you know, and adapt the work to ensure that gender drivers, as Chrissy said, the gender drivers and the using opportunities to bring them into conversations in a way, it, it, in conversations that we wouldn't normally necessarily have been in and opportunities to really instill them in ways that we perhaps wouldn't have had the opportunity. So it's, it's, um, it, it's really heartening in spite of the, the, the challenges as you've um, talked about, Mandy. So yeah, if I, I also say, I think it yeah. also really shows um, the important link between prevention and response and how yeah. it's really hard to yeah. separate them and how as practitioners we kind of need to be across both. Yeah, such a good point, Chrissy. So, yeah, so, such a good point. Um, Susan, could I ask you from your perspective as a counsellor, 
Um, obviously, as you've mentioned, and I know very well that um, Darabin continue to lead in prevention, um, in the prevention space and, and have done so, as we heard from um, Kelly's um, presentation earlier. But have you got any insights that you could share with us um, about working in organisations where the leadership seeking to engage prevention and gender equality work to ensure it continues to be um, prioritised? Um, and I suppose particularly as we're ideally moving into that phase of COVID recovery, um, you know, and, and yeah, perhaps what the role is of, of leadership. We've heard from Mandy and, and Chrissy about the ways that they are engaging, but um, yeah, it'd be great to hear from, from you um, in that councillor role. Sure, I think um, firstly, it's important to recognise that some councillors will understand what gender equity means. Some councillors will understand the drivers of violence against women, but many won't. And therefore, in order to get the leadership, we need to make sure the leaders have access to good quality information. That's not a given because it can be quite difficult to get in front of councillors. The briefing agenda for councillors is very busy. Um, when new councillors are elected, there's going to be a, a sort of program of briefings that will stretch out over months and there'll be a lot of people trying to get in front of councillors but there's never been a more important time than in the first few months of council to make sure this is on council's agenda, particularly as councils go into developing their next four year council plan. And so if you want significant or profound change across an organisation, if, this, if you want this to be an area of focus, it has to get into the council plan. And that means there has to be at least one councillor who champions it. It often doesn't have to be more than one. One really effective councillor can get something on a council plan through the numerous strategic workshops that councillors will be involved in where they get to talk about their priorities. So if you have one or two champions within a council who know what they're talking about, who know how to argue, um, who know how to debate and how to present the importance of doing this, they can make an extraordinary difference. And I think that some people might think that all decisions are made in a council chamber and formal decisions are made in a council chamber, but so much happens in council briefings where the staff of the council hear from councillors what their priorities are. And that means that actually it's a great time to speak to candidates because some candidates will get elected and some candidates will talk about these issues as issues of importance and that will influence other candidates to also consider that they're important. So even a candidate who ultimately is not successful at getting elected may be successful at influencing the agenda of other councillors or other candidates who do get elected. So, so that's one thing I would say about that leadership um, is that you need people who understand it and who have the language to be able to champion it with others. And, and the second thing is that point about the council plan that um, it's very difficult two years into a council term to get an organisation to reorient the direction it's heading in and to put more resources into a particular area of work if that wasn't anticipated in the council plan. And I think that can be quite hard for councillors who get into a council for the first time. They think they've got four years to kind of execute an agenda. And what they discover is that if they miss that, that council plan opportunity, it can be very difficult down the track to, to get change. That particularly imply, uh, applies where there are resources involved. So if what the council needs is actually get a, to get a dedicated staff member because they've never had that before, then that's the type of thing that could happen through the council planning process. And, and that's a way, I suppose, for councillors to have an impact where ordinarily councillors don't get involved in staffing matters. So it's, it's outside the scope of powers of a councillor to direct the CEO to employ someone. Um, but what the council can do is set the policy directive, which is that this should be an area of more focus and therefore the CEO will have the resources. Yeah, I think it's so true, Susan, when we talk about prevention practitioners and the practice and the skills and expertise they need to have, it's kind of, you know, they need to have all of the everything I often describe it as. You need to be 
have a strategic brain, you need to understand, you know, the, the planning cycle in a council, you need to understand the planning cycle, you need to understand there's a capital works budget, you need to understand the implications of embedding it within your health plan. Um, we've heard about, you know, working with planners and design guidelines and, you know, working with, with those areas to get those good practice, um, you know, design principles happening. So, you know, it, comms, you know, you need to work with comms, so you need to understand that. You need to have a bit of everything as a prevention practitioner. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that you need to have in bucket loads is partnership ability to actually engage with partners. Yeah. And I think that's really critical because I recognise that sometimes if you're a band five or a band six or a band seven staff member of the council, you won't have direct access to council laws. Mm -hmm. What you might have is particularly good relationships with some relevant agencies in your community, like Women's Health and the, you know, the, the Women's Health Services here, here in Darabin, we've got Women's Health in the North. Mm. They've done a lot of amazing work in this space. They've really been leaders. They've set a regional agenda. It may be that it's actually easier for you to go outside your organisation to come back in. And, and by that, I mean, go and speak to the CEO of the Women's Health Organisation in your region, get them to approach the councillors, and actually say this needs to be high on the agenda. And that mm -hmm. I think, is the way to overcome the challenge of being a band six worker in council who has no direct access to councillors and who in fact, the, the rules are pretty clear. You're not allowed to go and kind of speak directly to councillors and seek to influence mm. um, directions in that way. It has to go up to a hierarchy. So uh, I would say go around the hierarchy rather than trying to kind of go through it if you are encountering obstacles. So that's just yeah. a, a little private tip for the hundred. <laughs> And I think, you know, as Mandy and Chrissy have, have articulated beautifully, you know, too, you know, speaking to that partnership, you're, you're, you're leading these, these um, strategies and these projects, but you're bringing other people in to work with you. You're not expected, you know, to, to hold all of the pieces. Yeah, part of that partnership work is to bring in those key, whether internal stakeholders or external, who do you need at the table that, that might lead some of those pieces of work for you? You don't need to be, um, you know, driving all of those um, pieces of work, although, you know, sometimes I think you feel like you can be. Um, but, yeah, bringing those partnerships in, you know, who, who do you need at the table? Who's missing? Who can I work with? Who can benefit the work that we're doing? Um, I might, that's a perfect segue, really. I might... Um, throw back to, to, to Chrissy or, or Mandy, if there are other recommendations or actions um, that you wanted to talk about, you know, about keeping, yeah, um, prevention and gender equality work on the agenda now and into the future, you know, perhaps more broadly, or you might want to reflect back on something. I saw Mandy, you had your, your hand up. Do you want to jump in first? That'd be great. Yeah, sure. I think some of the points I wanted to make here, we've touched on, but just to yeah. really touch on them because I think they're so important. And work in partnership is just absolutely huge. You can't do this work alone and, and you need all those voices and the different perspectives. And the point that Chrissy made, I've been reflecting on, and she's so right, that um, res prevention and response need to come together. And... Out, out in this region, there's a Frankston Mornington Peninsula Family Violence Network, and I make sure I always go because the focus is on response. So you've got, you know, your Good Shepherds and your Angler Care and your Brotherhood of St Lawrence around the table. It's so important for me to be in that space mm. and learn from each other. Um, I guess to Susan's point, gain leadership commitment to this work is really important. But on the flip side, I'd say um, it's let's never underestimate ground up swell and, and people around you and um, advocates and allies. So I find that both works really well together. But my biggest point would be have a plan or a policy, you know, have a guiding document that you're working to so you, you, you see those achievements and you can report on them and celebrate them because... It is long-term, yeah, big work. And so I think that that's, that's really an important piece. Thanks, Mandy. Chrissy. 
have any thoughts about other yeah, recommendations yeah, or actions? Um, I definitely echo what both Mandy and Susan have said, you know, stressing the importance of leadership. Um, and I'm lucky at Casey, you know, all levels from my manager up to our CEO are really strong advocates for gender equality and prevention work. And that makes it my job a lot easier. Um, partnerships with um, community, you know, organisations. Um, and I think one thing that's really important is and something around advocacy for longer term, more sustainable funding. You know, we often have a one year funding agreement or three years and as we know, prevention is, Randy, I love the fact that you've got a 10 year strategy. That's fantastic. And I feel like it would be great if we could have um, that mirrored by the funding that we could receive. So maybe we can do some more advocacy around that. And coming out of COVID and where there has been that spotlight on family violence, um, potentially now is the time to kind of up that work. But I think I think everyone's already you know, said the important points that I, I would um, echo. Thank you. I um. We're going to throw to, to Q&A in a minute, but I, I was keen to kind of um, to wrap this up, um, this section up by um, perhaps just um, an individual reflection or motivation. I think particularly in the current context, it's, it's nice to pick those what are you inspired by moments, um, but what keeps you motivated? I'm keen to know what keeps you motivated or is giving you hope about that we're making progress in the work, you know, to create a, a world where women and children live free from violence. Um, and perhaps there's a success, you know, and I think they're often those little, those small, you know, conversations or those small little moments or small little wins. But I think, yeah, what, what keeps you motivated or gives you hope, you know, in this work? Because I think to your point, Chrissy, you know, in these short funding cycles that's usually yeah the bandwagon I'm on so I'm, I'm so glad someone mentioned it um, you know it's a long-term game and it's hard to sustain yourself in that in that work so is there there's something that motivates you or has given you hope or inspired you in the last you know week month couple of months that you could share a little success with us before we duck into q and A's? I'll open that up to if anyone wants to share I'll go. I don't yeah, go, I don't Mandy. Know. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I don't know. I just think they're those little moments of working in partnership. I think particularly in COVID because I'm a social person and to be at home like this. So for me, that family violence collaborative learning off each other, I think the Vic Health funding has just given, like us all, a bit of a, a boost. A boost, to, yeah do that really important cultural change work with men, boys and the whole community. And I'm really quite passionate about that. And, and, and honestly, the tireless work of victim survivors keeps me motivated. Yep. Mm. Thanks, Mandy. Chrissy or Susan? It's to me that it's really important to remember that change is not always linear. So. Mm. It doesn't kind of move in a straight line. And if you look at campaigns on all kinds of social issues, you'll have moments of feeling as though you're not moving very fast and then great leaps in short spaces of time. And those great leaps don't come out of nowhere. They come off the back of decades of work that's been done. Mm -hmm. um, but I see that in many campaigns that I've been involved with, and I think it's always worth remembering, that, you know, things might be slow at times and then there are great leaps forward. Um, thank you. And for me, I think what motivates me, lots of different things, but I guess in my daily work, it's, you know, when I do roll out initiatives or training within the organisation or within the community, the feedback is overwhelmingly positive and, and everyone is saying this should be compulsory, we want more, what else can we do? And getting that feedback of people being interested and motivated themselves through the work we do, even if we change, you know, a couple of people's perceptions or raise awareness of the drivers of family violence, um, 
to one person, it's going to have a ripple effect as they start talking to other people. The other thing that Susan talked a little bit about is that t change takes time. And, and I am motivated by the generational change that we have seen since our grandmothers, our great grandmothers. And, and I have two little girls and that's a huge mm -hmm. motivator that if I can somehow contribute in some way to make it a bit easier for that next generation, then, then we're in going towards the right direction. Fantastic. Thanks, Chrissy. We're going to um, have a little bit of um, Q&A now. We'll open up the session for questions. We've got a few here um, and I'm going to, I'm just having a quick look at one that's been, been given a few um, thumbs up. Um, so we'll be prioritising, as I said earlier, questions um, from the presentation that we've just heard that have received the most votes. Just another little reminder that um, that if you do need support, if, it, if you're finding these conversations challenging, that the, um, the support services are pinned in the chat window. Um, and we'll have time for hopefully a few questions. Um, and I might direct, you know, the question to one of the panellists to start. You don't all have to, to respond, but if you're particularly keen, um, please, you know, um, let me know. So the first question that's received the highest number of votes so far, the question is around what the panel thinks are the top three high impact activities for a small rural local government um, that they can deliver within limited resources. And um, so I'm assuming, you know, high, high impact activities around prevention of violence and gender equality work that lo rural local governments can deliver with limited resources. All the, the kind of trifecta of challenge, really, you know. Does anyone have any thoughts on that? Who else wants to go first? Okay, Susan. So I, I would start by challenging the premise of the question, which is that this should be delimit, delivered with limited resources. And I think if that's the message you're getting, then don't accept it. This deserves equal resources to any other issue. In fact, it deserves more resources than any other issue. This is a human rights issue for 50% of the population, which is the right to live free from violence. If someone says, oh, well, we, we're willing, but we don't have m many resources, then push back. And I know that's not easy, and, I, and I, I don't want to detract from other answers people might give around things that can be done with few resources. But I think it's important to, to challenge that idea that um, we should just do our best in an under-resourced field. This is a human rights issue impacting on 50% of the population. We, as women, have a right to live free from violence, and appropriate resources should be devoted to achieving that. Yeah, you hear. Unfortunately, the reality though is that sometimes we still need to operate with, with those limited resources. So completely continue to fly that banner of human rights and, and more funding. Um, I would say one of the ideas I'd have for that is around potentially a training of trainers model, um, where you train up a group of committed community members from across different um walks of life, whether it's, you know, sports clubs, schools, small businesses, um, emergency services, whatever, and potentially bring them together. And we've kind of done this with our uh, Champions of Change model at the City of Casey, training them up to be trainers and to give them the capacity and resources to roll it out within their own organisations um, and providing packs and resources and professional development that would, you know, that that one-off small kind of training that then supported framework and community of practice that they can continue to both advise and mentor themselves um, with, a, with a bit of overview from council, um, but can certainly roll it out and adapt to their own um, circumstances, I guess. It's one idea. Yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, my brain went to training and education and the train the trainer is probably a good model to get the most 
to get the most out of it. Also, internally in their organisation, I would advocate that it's such a critical topic for staff to have on their, we call it a learning and development calendar, whatever, whatever that rural council um, calls it. See if you can get it embedded there so that it doesn't cost you <laughs> as a team or whatever. And then my other thing would be just back to that point of working in partnership, I'd just look outside and have you got a women's health service? Have you got a primary care partnership? I don't know. Just and who are the local shakers and movers in community and bring them together and then they can look at what projects or community awareness raising activity they want to do. Mm. That's where I'd start, I think. And thank you all. It, I mean, it, it, it's such a great question because the even the language I think I, that I you know, stopped on was high you know what are your top three high impact activities and as you've all demonstrated throughout today and talked about um it, it, it's kind of that notion of just do something and small you know conversations you know as you talked about Chrissy you know that um that train up leaders that enable them to have you know ongoing conversations with community with their teams with they're really powerful and important and impactful. You know, I think any of the, the work that we're doing, whether it's hugely funded or small, you know, community-based, you know, projects are, are, are still important ways to get the work started and to, to maintain the work. Um, you know, it's how you measure high impact, but I think it, it, having these, continuing to have these conversations is still, you know, it, 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 I would I would say it's, it's still very impactful and very, very important. Mm. And to um, point that it's about mobilising community because that that's where you get momentum. So whether it's through the train, the trainer or whatever, I think that's a critical point, you know, start like the movement and it takes on its own mm. way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, as you said, Mandy, getting your, your movers and shakers, getting your natural leaders who are already wanting to be involved, yeah. wanting to be, they're wanting to volunteer their time and their energy mm -hmm. and, and working with them to, to get them to decide what their own solutions are. They know their community the best. Mm -hmm. And I think um, possibly the most important person who can make sure is on message is the mayor. And that means investing time and energy in making sure the mayor understands the issue and knows what language to use and how to speak about the issue is absolutely critical because mm. they become your council spokesperson and if they are not on message, if their language is off, if it excuses violence or, or suggests in any way that women are responsible, then there is a, a profound problem that is going to be difficult to overcome in, in other initiatives. Mm. Thanks, Susan. The next question um, is picking up on what Mandy talked about earlier and asks, what does, um, what do you think is helpful for the general public? Um, what is helpful for the general public um, to know, I assume? Um, what is helpful for the general public to know or to understand so that they can make the link between gender equality and violence against women? That's a really good question. And at the moment with our communications Facebook campaign, um, one thing you also to equip yourself with is uh, how to manage resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and Mary Ann's you know, DBRC, we've done her training and she's just mentioned she's going to be bringing that online because we, you know, as soon as you mention, you can mention family violence or violence against women and you might have support. As soon as you link it to gender inequality, you'll get resistance, unfortunately. And, and so I'm still, you know, I guess we're still working out the best way to meet people where we're at that. And usually you have community advocates will come and respond as well. Um, but I have just completely lost the questions. <laughs> oh, no, that's all right. Um, 
what do you think it's helpful for the general public to know so that they can make the link between gender and yeah that's right um and so i guess giving really practical examples of what mm. it looks like because you can say a driver of violence is the condoning of violence against women and people would go what do you mean? No one in yeah. their right mind will condone violence. But when you mm. give examples like, oh, boys will be boys, oh, she was asking for it, or um, what does she think she's wearing, Which, you know, those kind of things are the condoning of violence that are put into people's everyday language. And you don't even realise mm. until you unpack it that that's what it actually is doing. So I guess mm. giving real life examples, highlighting real stories from real people in everyday language is important to you know, unpack the lingo. Mm. And the Our Watch video, the Change the Story video, I think is very powerful and very clear. And we've used that in our campaign to try and raise awareness and, and make that link between gender and mm. Yeah, I, I think it's not a quick thing. I think it's even taking me as a worker. It, it took time to absorb. So you go to training, but then to actually really take it in and put the pieces together. But... Um, our women's health out here have done some nice, um, I think we call it tiles, but it's for social media. And I, I think to Chrissy's point, breaking it down, giving examples. So some of the things they've done in COVID of just saying like, you know, is, this is an opportunity to look at who's doing the majority of work at home. Is it a time to, um, you know, household chores? Is it, you know, opportunity to kind of shake that up in, in COVID? So, I don't know some examples like that of just a breaking, breaking the breaking it down and giving practical examples of how you might reflect on that at home or in your family and make changes. Mm. Thank you, um, Susan. Did you have anything else you wanted to add on that about um, the? I've lost my question. Um, I was happy to move to the next question and provide more. Perfect. So I'm I'm mindful of time. I'm just having a look through the questions. Um, there's a lots of um, 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 support for the fantastic work and the, and people are really heartened to hear the great work that you have all been um, undertaking. Um, and also just acknowledging the long term um, that that we're in, you know, long term change um, work. Um, also acknowledging, I think, um, great to hear the depth of understanding um, of the gender drivers and the importance of prevention work in council settings. That's from fabulous Liz at, um, at Vic Health, particularly at this this time where crisis response is also essential, which you talked about, you know, the link between prevention and and response. Um, I don't know, just given the time, um, we might leave those questions and we'll provide, as we said, a frequently asked questions and responses um, and we'll share that um, later. We'll also have um, it available on Basecamp or you can pick up conversations on Basecamp, um, the Partners in Prevention um, space, if you're not familiar with it get in contact with us and we can um, uh, sign you up. Um, so thank you, um, everyone. I think we'll, we'll close it there. We would like to really um, just give such a huge thank you to our um, guest panellists today, to Kelly Nagel, to Susan Rennie, to Mandy Roche, to Chrissy Nicholson. Um, and thank you so much for sharing your insights, your wisdom, and your fabulous work um, today. It's so inspiring and heartening and fabulous to hear about and to share the space with you. Um, we will be uploading an edited recording of the webinar on our YouTube channel. That's, I think someone asked before, that's DVRCV's YouTube channel. So if you go to our website, you'll find a link um, there or get in contact with us if you can't find that and we'll share a link. Um, as well as um, the, the, the Q&A and feedback to some of the questions that we've received today. Um, you've probably already received an email too um, with a link um, just to give us some feedback. As you know, evaluation is queen. We really appreciate it and value your feedback. So if you could just spend a couple of minutes 
filling that in, that'll help us um, on our future PIP webinars. Um, and I just want to acknowledge and finish up by um, yeah, acknowledging that these times are unprecedented and, and isolating and um, as Mandy I think said, you know, for those of us who are social creatures and I think in this space where we all work in partnerships and collaboration, um, I think prevention practitioners might be finding this particularly challenging. So yeah, we're really committed to providing at DBLCV as many opportunities that we can as a sector um, that's committed to ending violence against women, that we're committed to um, providing opportunities where we can come together and connect in different ways. And this is but one of them. So thank you so much um, to our panel. Thanks um, to you, our fantastic audience. And thanks to my um, fantastic colleagues who are behind the scenes um, pedaling furiously to make us all look and sound fabulous. Um, I really appreciate all of your wisdom today. You've given us so much to think about and um, get excited about and energised by and inspired by. Um, if you're not a PIP member, we encourage you to, to join and sign up and you'll find again the details on our, our website. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Take care and um, we'll see you soon. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thanks.